Lecture. Mom always liked you best. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth session of our seminar on family dynamics. Before I introduce the topic for today's discussion, I'd like to ask you a question. What do you think is likely to be the longest relationship in your life? I mean the one that lasts for the greatest number of years. Ah, you smile. Think you know the answer to this one, do you? Okay, go ahead, shoot. The relationship with my parents. They've known me since I was born. Actually, probably before I was born. They tell me that they used to play Mozart for me when my mom was still pregnant, and I would start kicking. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the relationship with my mother will be especially long, because I know she'll never stop mothering me. <laughs> well, I think maybe my longest relationship will be with my own kids. No, no. It's got to be with your spouse, because you'll know him before your kids. Actually, I'm not sure I'll ever get married, so maybe my longest relationship will be with my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Well, these are all reasonable assumptions, and they may turn out to be true for some of you. And I hope that Joe's dog sets a record for canine longevity. <laughs> <laughs> but statistically, you have missed the mark. Because in fact, in most cases, the longest relationships any of us will have are with our siblings. Yes, that's right. Think about it. Nobody else in our lives may know us from beginning to end. In the U.S., about 80% of us have at least one sibling, and you typically know your siblings from the day you or they are born. Certainly, this is sooner than you will know your spouses or children. And generally, you and your siblings can expect to live longer than your parents, and certainly a lot longer than the average dog. Okay, so today we're going to talk about sibling relationships, some of the key issues that affect their development within the family and how these relationships affect your social development outside the family through your entire life. Wow. wow. <laughs> I never thought about it like that. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. First off, let me ask what you believe, what assumptions you make, based on your own experience or observations about siblings. Just raise your hands if you agree with the following statements. One, by and large... Siblings who grow up under the same roof will have similar impressions or memories about family interactions. Okay, I see that about 75% of you agree with this statement. Next statement. Two. Even though you may feel that your parents have a favorite child, parents really do love their children equally and seldom play favorites. Ah, yes, I hear a little nervous laughter here and fewer hands went up. But we still have about 55 to 60 percent of you who agree with this statement. That still leaves quite a few of you who may suffer from what I like to call the mom always liked you best syndrome. I'm curious though, how many of you are parents of two or more children? Okay, now how many of you agree that you love your children equally? Okay, just as I thought. About 95% of these parents agree that no matter how their children may feel, they really do love their children equally. Next statement. Three. For the most part, it is much better for a child to grow up in a home where there is no fighting or competition with siblings. Hmm. Some of you look surprised that about 90% of you raised your hands. We'll touch later on why you felt that you might be the only one to feel that way. And the last statement. Four. If, in fact, it is true that your parents actually do tend to play favorites, in general, it would be best for your overall social development to actually be the favorite child rather than to be a less favorite child. Ah, right. I see that you're thinking hard about this one. Okay, now you must choose. Raise your hand if you agree. Let's see, 38, 39. That's a little over 75% of you who agree. All right. 
Now let's look at these four assumptions one by one and see if researchers agree with you or if their findings will bust some myths, that is, alter your beliefs or assumptions about siblings. The first assumption, that siblings growing up in the same household will have similar impressions or memories of the same events or experiences, is more often than not false. Congratulations to the 25% of you that remembered what you learned in Psychology 101 about the powers of observation and memory and the crucial role that emotions play in creating the size and shape of the window through which we observe and experience something. Do you remember the classic experiment of simulating a crime in front of a classroom of students and then asking them to describe what happened? Not only were most of the students not able to accurately remember what had actually happened, but almost none of them agreed with any of the other students about what had happened. I'm not surprised about that. I guess I just didn't think of sibling experiences in the family as being such a big deal. Really? Judy Dunn, a British developmental psychologist, says that a sibling relationship, being the first and often most important peer relationship in individual experiences, tends to be so highly emotionally charged that it can turn family life into a daily drama for children, each of whom is competing for a starring role. Which brings us to the second assumption, that regardless of their children's perceptions, parents typically do love their children equally. Well, guess what, everyone? Researchers have shown in several different studies that at least 65% of mothers and 70% of fathers exhibit a preference for one particular child. And the emphasis here is on exhibit. Many researchers now think that the other 30 to 35% just hide their preferences well from observers and even from themselves. I'm not sure this would be true in my culture, my parents play favorites sometimes, and we all accept it and are happy with this. Yes, of course, I understand this. Heidi Riggio at California State University explains that not only is it painful for American parents to think about how they may have failed their children, whose experiences of favoritism, unfairness, and even generally getting less love are forever incorporated into their personalities, but also that while in other cultures parents may be willing to admit they treated the eldest son best, for example, this is not generally true in America, with its emphasis on fairness and equality. Dunn has also found that children who feel that they are being treated very differently than their siblings can have serious difficulties in relationships for their entire lives. In addition, according to Claire Stocker, at the University of Denver, they are at higher risk of developing anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem. And there are many famous folks from Freud to Dickens to Madonna who are examples of suffering the consequences of least favored status in the family. So, what do you think now about assumption three? Is it better to grow up without competing or fighting with your siblings? Maybe more of you want to say yes now, but wait. Many family therapists claim that sibling rivalry, or competition, is normally a good thing. Family therapist Diane Barth claims that when siblings learn to fight and then negotiate a peace, they are learning a formula for resolving conflicts for the rest of their lives. On the other hand, if siblings hardly ever fight, then the opportunity to develop this skill may be lost. Psychologist Hara Morano suggests that the longevity of our relationships with our siblings leads to a deep sense of a shared fate and that we tend to replicate our sibling relationships in both work and in love. So, on to the fourth assumption, that if we accept the fact that parents do play favorites, it is, generally speaking, best to be the favorite child in the family. I'm sure that by now you've caught on to the pattern here and know that I'm about to bust another myth. Jeffrey Kluger, in an article in Time magazine, tells us that, and I quote, It would seem that being the favorite may boost self-esteem and confidence, but studies show it can also leave kids with a sense of arrogance and entitlement. Not very pleasant characteristics, right? He goes on to say that, Unfavored children may grow up wondering if they're somehow unworthy of the love the parents lavished on the golden child. But they, 
the unfavored children, may do better at forging relationships outside the family as a result of that. Why do you think this is so? What do you think Kluger is getting at here? For homework, please read the Kluger article and then write a paragraph explaining what you think he means by this. And then write another paragraph or two based on your own experience or observations, either agreeing or disagreeing with Kluger. Okay? See you all next week. Have a great weekend.